go. Thank you for being here. The art of living, the art of speaking, are how to do things with words. So here's where we're going tonight. We're going to start with words, philosophy of language. We're going to go to Aristotle's rhetoric. We're going to go to structural and post-structural linguistics. You're welcome. Uh, we're going to the simulacrum. And, of course, we're always talking about meaning. Always. So, here we go. What's in a word? <clears throat> the philosophy of language actually begins with a dialogue from Plato called the Cratylus. You probably haven't heard of it. It's not one of his better dialogues. In fact, it's a little weird. And some people claim that he's not being serious in the dialogue because there's a long, very long section where Socrates goes on and on uh, about this topic. I think that's wrong. I think he is serious about it. But here's the gist of it. It's a, it's a dialogue about the correctness of names, by which he means words. But he's especially interested in proper nouns. There's Hermogenes, who, is, who gives the position, represents the position of conventionalism which is that words can mean anything you want them to mean. Doesn't matter. There's no connection between the word and the thing. Right? Languages themselves would seem to support homogenies, right? You can have many languages refer to the same thing. Cratylus, however, wants to argue for naturalism, that there is a natural connection between the word and the thing. This seems odd, unless you're Plato, because Plato is invested in the forms, but let me put it the other way. Plato is invested in the things of the world having connection to the ultimate reality of the forms. And the forms are these perfect representations of things. And ultimately, the, the whole world of the forms, I can't even say universe because it's not really that. The forms are like apart from all this. There's these, just think of them as these perfect ideals. And, and of, the, of all the ideals, for example, there's an ideal of hoarseness. So when you see a horse, what you're seeing is a pale reflection, an imperfect reflection of hoarseness, the form hoarseness. Uh, but the, the major forms are goodness, truth, and beauty, and the highest form is the good. Okay. Well, if that's your position, then words have to have a naturalistic or metaphysical connection to the thing. They have to. Right? So, and that puts you in a very difficult position. I would say an untenable position. But that's Plato's position in the Cratylus, is this kind of limited naturalism, where the word has a connection to the thing. Now, it's just untenable, but that was the philosophy of language for millennia. It was. And you think, why would that be? Well, it helps if you're part of Greece, and you don't really consider anything else worthwhile. <laughs> so you really have one language, right? And so that helps. I've got one language. And so this word uh, in Greek means this, and there's a natural connection. But what about Egyptian? I, I don't care about the Egyptians. I'm Greek. Right? So natural connection in the language. Interestingly, in the dialogue, he thinks that that's true for proper names, too. So Charlie is named Charlie because he has a certain Charliness. <laughs> okay. Okay, they're, they're on board with that. Uh, I noticed Lauren is not on board with it. She's just smiling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so isn't that an odd thing, an odd position on words, an odd philosophy of language? Well, yes, it is, but, but again, not when you're Greek writing at the height of Greek civilization. And then later, not when you're Christian, having, having merged Greek philosophy with Christian theology. Because in the beginning was the Word, 
and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, so we've got this notion of the Word as God, as divine. And that has influenced Western philosophy since Plato. I hate to say since Plato, but it's usually true since Plato. It has. And so our notions of authorship, for example, uh, it's no accident that we think of authors as divine or at least divinely inspired, right? Because they're producing the word, right? And so your job as a listener reader is to understand the message of the author, the divine author perhaps, or at least an a divine-like author who's giving you this message. So messages, the word, language, has in Western thought been really um, strange <laughs> based on these assumptions in the Cratylus and in Christian theology. All right. And this was picked up in the 20th century by a philosopher named Ludwig Wittgenstein. Uh, and it was called, actually it comes from Augustine, St. Augustine, but he picked up on it. He, he was an analytical philosopher in the Tractato, Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, and um, analytical philosophers are not very much fun. They're just about trying to find true pro propositions. All right? they, don't want, they want all ambiguity and irony out of words, out of language, and they just want what's clear and distinct, right? They just want to know clear, understandable propositions. So they like math very much. And they kind of want to make philosophy mathematical. And they kind of want to make your life mathematical, right? And my life. So uh, Wittgenstein and some of his comrades in the Vienna Circle and such said that words have meaning only in relation to empirical facts. See? Plato. Different version of Plato in the Cratylus, but still, same thing. Words connected to the thing. And Wittgenstein and his comrades said, a proposition, a philosophical proposition, that is a philosophical statement, is a picture of reality. Or, if it's not, it's useless. Useless. Well, this presents a whole host of problems, right? So, for example, we just don't use language that way. We just don't. So, for example, if you say the man in the moon does not exist, is that a true statement? There's no correspondence to reality because you're denying the reality of something. And we deny things all the time, propositionally, in our lives, right? No, I didn't do that, right? So you're saying that's a nonsensical statement? <laughs> do not laugh at that. <laughs> right, so that's a real problem. You can't use negatives in language. So the man in the moon does not exist is a nonsensical statement. You know what else is a nonsensical statement? The very fundamental nature of logical positivism and the picture theory of language. A proposition is a picture of reality does not correspond to anything in reality. But that's the heart of the philosophy, that statement, right? A proposition is a picture of reality. Show me the proposition. Where is it? I don't see it, feel it, taste it, measure it. Where's the proposition? Then it can't be true, right? Because words must refer to empirical facts. Well, the heart of your philosophy does not refer to an empirical fact. So you have a problem. Now, here's what I like about Wittgenstein. Excuse me. He's one of the few philosophers who changes his mind. So at the beginning, the Tractatus, he's an analytical philosopher. At the end of his life, you can see he's aged some there, he is a philosopher of language. This comes in the Philosophical Investigations, where he talks about, it just changes completely. And he says, meaning is use. 
The meaning of words is how we use them, right? Okay, so now he's kind of a pragmatist. He's gone to the other side here, where words are part of games. In fact, he calls them language games. Okay, now that's pretty interesting, isn't it? So what is a game? He means game in the theoretical sense. Game is something that uses arbitrary rules in a certain space and time, right? So go out to Dodger Stadium tonight and put on a glove, really? Okay. Put on a glove and, and just try not to follow the rules. So, for example, go after the pitcher with your bat. That's not in the rules, and you, they will stop the game, right? Same thing on a basketball court. It's, it's actually sacred space and time. It's, it's a separate space and a separate time in which arbitrary rules apply. And, and they're arbitrary, but they're very real. So, for example, if you're Steph Curry and you sell your mouthpiece, that's going to cost you $50,000 because you broke the rules of the game. Wittgenstein says that's how language works. It's arbitrary, it's artificial, but it's real. Meaning that the rules apply, right? So, I could very well break the rules up here. And you would know it immediately, and I'm not going to, so don't ask me to, Charlie. But you know what I mean. There are any number of ways I could break the contract we have, break the rules of this game. But I'm not going to. But that's how language works, according to Wittgenstein. Now, notice the, the distance we've traveled. We've traveled from basic, just in Wittgenstein, we've traveled from basically a mathematical proposition about how language works to games, to play. Remember that. Wittgenstein is a precursor for what's to come. What's to come? Words are not words, they are signs. I'm sorry for all the old white men tonight. Um, I know, but yeah, all right. Ferdinand de Saussure, a Swiss linguist, uh, early 20th century, great mustache though, um, says that we shouldn't think of words as words at all. We should think of them as signs, as indicators. Um, and what, what is a sign then? Well, he says a sign is this. The sign is made up of two parts. It's the signifier plus the signified. I know, just bear with me a little bit. Uh, the signifier is the material object. So when I say object, it's made of sound, right? So that's a signifier. The signified is, is what happens in your mind when you hear or, experience or see the object, right? So mental concept is signified. Material reality, words on paper or words spoken that's the signifier. Okay, so what? Well, the so what is that signs, signifiers and signifieds together, are completely arbitrary and unmotivated. What does he mean by that? He's taking on Plato. Finally, in 1920, whatever this is, finally, someone is saying, you know, Plato was wrong. These signs have no natural connection to their reference. He called them reference, just think of things. There's no natural connection between the sign and the thing. How then do words make meaning? Do signs make meaning? Ah, he says meaning is generated through difference. Difference. Stay with me. Uh, this is structural linguistics, but it's going to pay off, I hope. Who mocked me? Was that you, Margo? Okay. All right. So, <laughs> so, so let me tell you a little story. So I have keys to the university. Now, we got these not too long ago. We rekeyed the place. And so I have to get into a lot of places, and you notice they're not marked. The easy thing would be to mark them, I know, but I didn't do that. But I can tell where the keys go. I can tell.
tell this mainly because of their difference. So for example, I know that this big square key goes to the bookstore. I know that beside the gold square key are my office keys, which are silver and gold and of two different kinds. One's a sledge, one's a quick set. And then next to that, I see the library keys, etc. There's no connection here. I'm not putting the keys in the locks right now. It's the difference that's making them me. Now, sure enough, eventually the key has to go into the lock, but that's, that's another story. Hold, hold off on that. The difference is what matters here. The difference between the keys. If these were all the same keys, I'd, I'd have to go through them all every time, right? Because there was no difference. Imagine a deck of cards, all two of clubs. What are you going to do in that system? Not much. There's no difference within the system. Meaning is gained through the difference in the system. We actually talked about this in Meanings of America with the immigrant nation, the, the structure of difference, but we can come back to that if you want. Think about a traffic light. Well, if the traffic light was just green, 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 it would be like L.A., I know. Um, <laughs> Right? So even if, it, if you've got three spots, it's still green. The point being that difference is how things mean. Even if there's a referent, even if ultimately the key goes in the lock and it works, the function of the sign, whether it's keys, carts, or traffic lights, is difference. So what's important is not the referent, not the actual lock, not the real thing in the world, like Plato said, but within the system, the difference. All right, hang on. Because the great hair guy, old white guy, Jacques Derrida, French philosopher, comes along and introduces something called post-structuralism. Maybe you heard of it, post-structuralism. So Saussure is structuralism, meaning that meaning he argues that linguistic meaning occurs through this structure of difference between signs. Derrida comes along and says, you know what? Saussure was right. He just wasn't right enough. So not only is there no connection between the sign and the referent, there he goes deeper. There's no connection between the signifier and the signified. So you can have a sign. I can say a word. And you can have, in this group, different mental objects come into mind. And isn't that right? That he's right. You can have different objects come into mind, mental objects, right? Based on the signifier alone. So there's no connection between the signifier and the signified. What does that mean? Well, that means you never get to meaning. You never get to meaning. When I teach this in a classroom, I always bring a dictionary, um, an actual print dictionary, you know, a book. <laughs> and I'll hand it to a student and I'll say, look up the word text, please, and read it to the class. And she will say, a text is a um, set of symbols. I said, wait, what's a symbol? And she will turn to symbol and she will say, a symbol is a re representation of, I'm sorry, what's representation? You see, you just keep going from sign to sign to sign. And so meaning is always deferred, right? Now, this, this is what most people don't understand about Derrida. They think he means that all is lost and, you know, there's no meaning in the world. He doesn't mean that. That's ridiculous, but that's how people took it, which is interesting in itself, that people thought that you could actually destroy meaning with a French theorist. Um, <laughs> what he meant is that, yes, you can have these moments, just these moments like we're having, right? We're having a moment. I think you understand me. Maybe not. We're talking about post-structuralism, but you, ha you have a general understanding of what I'm saying. His point is, that's all you get, is that moment. You can't build anything on it. You certainly can't build a metaphysics on it, like Plato, see, 
how we're coming back, like Plato and Christian theology did. You can't build a metaphysics or a theology. You can't build something absolute on something so flimsy. Like these, these moments we have. We're coming to a consensus for the moment. This is the difference. I'm glad you said that. So we're not building a, a metaphysics on it. Right? We're not saying, and therefore, this must always be true and is absolutely true and was always true. It's a version of the forms. You can't do that. What you can do is say, I understand, Charlie. Yeah, I get it, man. That's it. But that's all you can do. And in fact, he says, I don't want to get into this too much, but his, one of his major essays is called Structure, Sign, and Play in the Human Sciences. And his argument is basically that Anything that you try to do beyond language is always outside of language. And therefore not in the language, so you actually can't use language to get there. The center, anyway, I don't want to get into that. The point being, this is post-structuralism. It, it informs, to a degree, postmodernism. although postmodernism is more of a style than anything. The point being, it sounds weird, it sounds counterintuitive, but I think it's what we live every day, right? It's like, but I said this. Well, I heard you say this. Right? The moment's gone, right? Or maybe it was never there, right? All right, thanks for hanging in there. Structuralism, post-structuralism. Now let's get real with our old friend Bhakti. Oh, wait. Mikhail Bakhtin, we heard from last time uh, on the art of thinking about how everything is grounded for him in the social world. And so, boy, that's really ugly. I'm sorry. This. I love this. He says that, <laughs> that words are grounded in social reality. Now, again, we like to think that words in that old model kind of exists like, like the forms, kind of like apart from everything, right, in their own world. He says that's never the case. Words are always grounded in social utterance, he says. Listen to this. I love this line, uh, this paragraph. As a result of the work done by all these stratifying forces in language, he says that language is, it's, it's human, is basically his argument, is that words are human. And like humanity, like a human being, there are all kinds of forces at work on a word. Stratifying forces in language, right? There are no neutral words. That's amazing, right? And that sounds right to me. And, word, and forms. Words and forms that can belong to no one. These don't exist. Language has been completely taken over, shot through with intentions and accents. And so you cannot ever lift the word out of its social context. That sounds right to me, right? Not the word is some outside thing that is untouched by me. In fact, it is thoroughly touched by me and you. Because words, that's what we pass around like a virus. <laughs> Sorry, there, there are other metaphors I could have used. There. Um, for any individual consciousness living within it, language is not an abstract system of normative forms, but rather a concrete heteroglot conception of the world. Heteroglot just means other tongues, other languages. Right? So, you know, for the Greeks, the, the word barbarian is, is Greek. Because when Greeks heard other people speak, they said, well, it sounds like bar, bar, bar. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Barbarian, right? Bhaktin says that's language. Language is always embedded with the cultures and societies from which it comes. A concrete heteroglot conception of the world. All wor words have the taste isn't that beautiful? The taste of a profession, a genre, a tendency, a party, a political party, a, pol a particular work, a particular person, a generation, an age group, the day and the hour. The word has that taste, right? Because it's passed through all those things 
and people and situations and utterances. Each word tastes of the context and contexts in which it has lived its socially charged life. All words and forms are populated by intentions, contextual overtones, generic tendencies, etc., are inevitable in the word. And this is from Stephen today. Stephen, who works in our library, just gave me this from Bakhtin. Truth is not born, nor it is to be found inside the head of an individual person. It is born between people collectively searching for truth in the process of their dialogic interaction. Well, that's what we're doing. That's us, right? That, I mean, make that the new motto of the university. A uh, Russian philosopher yeah, gave us our motto. It is born between people collectively searching for truth, and I would say never finding it, if you understand truth as something outside of yourself, in the process of their dialogic interaction. So for Bakhtin, a word never exists alone. Even if you pull a word out of a text and hold it up, that word has a history. It's been through so much, right? And you can taste it when you use the word. You can taste all those contexts in which it's been. And the contexts are almost infinite. All right, let's go now to rhetoric. All right, so it's interesting that in the art of living, we're actually doing the trivium, which was the curriculum for the, the first universities that were established in the Middle Ages. Grammar, rhetoric, and logic. Right? So grammar, how to, uh, how to write words, basically. Logic, which is what we did last week, the art of thinking, although they would have done it very differently. And now rhetoric, how to do things with words. So the difference, this is Aristotle. And you've already seen last week the difference between Plato and Aristotle. Uh, you may know the Raphael painting of the School of Athens. Um, you know, big landscape portrait and Athens in the background and Plato and Aristotle are right in the center. And Plato's pointing up and Aristotle's pointing like this. I love it, right? Because Plato's always looking for the forms. He's trying to rise above the world and Aristotle's trying to understand the world around him. Well, this is entirely appropriate, too, when it comes to language, when it comes to words. Because Plato wants to connect the word to the form Right? So it, it's like an accident here almost. It's a pale reflection of the thing it represents. But Aristotle's right, is like, no, you know, words kind of do things. They have function. And they have function depending upon their context. Uh, and he called this rhetoric. It's arguably Aristotle's most influential work, the rhetoric. So if you take a rhetoric class in college, or if you run for office, somebody's going to give you Aristotle. They may not say it's Aristotle, but they're going to give you Aristotle in one form or another. <clears throat> the word rhetoric comes from the Greek word rhema, which is a word for word. So, how to do things with words, rhetoric. Means of persuasion, there are basically three means of persuasion. Now, this is ancient, an ancient text, but notice how it works. Still applies. So the first way is ethos, which means basically your standing with the audience. So remember, Aristotle's never going to abstract you out of anything. He's going to start with where you are. And where you are is standing in front of an audience. So when you stand in front of an audience, the way you persuade, one of the three ways, three main ways you persuade an audience is with your ethos, with the quality of your character, right? So the speaker is credible. Now, again, this was the genius of Aristotle's because he recognized that how that can be conveyed changes and would change even in his own time with context. So, for example, not with you all, but if I were to go to, like I'm supposed to go up to um, Pacifica and do something, I'm probably going to have to say, you know, I have a PhD from blah, 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 and blah, 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 and I've written this. And 
you know, because I have to establish my credibility with that audience. I have no credibility with this audience, so it's much easier. Um, <laughs> but actually, that's another example of ex establishing credibility is you can downplay things. I'm just like you. This is what politicians do, even though they're completely unlike us. They're a whole different animal. <laughs> But that's the move, right? That's the move toward ethos, is, is I have credibility. So, for example, if, if I'm going back to Tennessee uh, over the holidays, where I'm from, if I talk like this, I'm just going to get my ass kicked. Because, <laughs> like, what are you doing? Ethos? Post-structuralism? What are you doing? Get out of here. And get me another beer. Um, well, I'm not going to talk like this, and I'm not going to talk in my accent that you're trying to out me <laughs> on. I know what you're doing. So, yet, yeah, I still have a Tennessee hillbilly accent that I can drop into, and Catherine loved that story when I told it to her. Right. The, the, well, it's about rhetoric, isn't it, Catherine? Thank you for adding to my lecture. <laughs> so yes, I, I went to school in Kentucky with, for my master's degree and there was a, uh, see now I'm aware of the way I'm speaking, thank you. Um, I had a friend there from Los Angeles and he had Plato's Republic out on his desk. Have I told you this story before? Yeah. He had Plato's Republic out on his desk and, and he's like, well where are you from? And I said, Tennessee. And he said, Tennessee? You don't talk like you're from Tennessee. And I said, well, like, hide my accent. And he said, you can't do that. And I said, oh, yes, you can. If you want a master's degree in philosophy, yes, you <laughs> certainly can. And so he said, no, I don't believe you. So I picked up Plato's Republic, and I read it <laughs> in my Tennessee twang. And he was literally on the floor laughing. <laughs> so I said, point made, right? So, right, uh, the ethos of the speaker is incredibly important. Um, the speaker can lose his audience, he won't even have an audience if without ethos. Uh, like, you wouldn't come out to hear just anyone on a Tuesday night, I hope, right? I mean, you do have some discrimination uh, in terms of your speakers. Um, we get this all the time. Frankly, we have people who ask to speak here, and we have to determine if the speaker has ethos. Usually that means a PhD or some other credential. Uh, and, you know, we have to make sure our audience is, is uh, recognizing our speaker's ethos. Right? So Will was here recently, and he has a PhD from Pacifica. Steven spoke here recently. He doesn't have a PhD, but he has a lot of experience in making movies, right? So, speaker ethos. Practical intelligence, uh, virtuous character, goodwill, these are all qualities of a good speaker that contribute to ethos. Many other things do, too. Ah, pathos. You know pathos. Here's something Aristotle said that Plato would have never said, is that you must arouse emotion in your audience, right? So Plato wants nothing to do with human ickiness like emotions. We must transcend our emotions with our mind. Not so Aristotle, so you know what? Everything involves emotion. So uh, you need to recognize that in your audience. And, you know, he, Aristotle didn't say play to this. Now, we're in such a jaded age right now that we hear something like this and, and we think, oh, we, we're going to manipulate someone. I suppose you can call it manipulation, but in ancient Greece it was an art, right? And it was simply the art of speaking. It was art of recognizing your audience and recognizing that your audience has, em has emotions and how to use that to make your point, to persuade, which is the point of rhetoric. Now, um, that has become a whole other thing now, as you know, where we go straight for the emotional effect. Um, I don't even get into social media. Yeah. Aristotle's longest chapter, I believe, in the rhetoric is about all the emotions and what you do to manage them in your audience. I'm going to have to read that, by the way, for you all. 
and then logos. This is what we talked about last time, right? So this is the argument. <clears throat> and we talked about this, induction and deductive reasoning. But Aristotle said uh, that what we really use, what we all use, professional speakers, public speakers, everyday life utterances and situations is the enthymeme. So I think you should feel free to use this word with your friends in another context. Point out an enthymeme when they're using it and say something like, awesome enthymeme, dude. What's an enthymeme? Well, you remember a syllogism, right? General premise, particular premise, and um, inescapable conclusion. All men are mortal, general premise. Uh, Socrates is a man, specific premise, Socrates. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Okay. An enthymeme is that three-part syllogism with one of the premises, or sometimes the conclusion, suppressed. You use it all the time. Listen. Hang on. Alice Walker, because I'm a girl, I do not get a gun. Right? Uh, only men should get guns, is the unstated premise. I am not a man, therefore I do not get a gun. There's something about it where if we see a syllogism, we go, ugh, a syllogism. But if we see an enthymeme, we're like, yeah, man, enthymeme. Awesome. Shakespeare, he would not take the crown, therefore to certain he was not ambitious. Right? So, Julius Caesar, blah, blah, blah. The hidden premise is an ambitious person would have accepted the crown. We use this all the time. It's really powerful to just hide one of the premises. If the glove doesn't fit, yeah, I'm sorry. If the glove doesn't fit, you must quit. The, the glove doesn't fit the, the defendant. The glove is evidence, is the unstated premise. The conclusion, you must quit. He must be a socialist because he favors a graduated income tax. Um, assumption, either other, I, anyone who favors a graduated income tax is a socialist or a socialist, is, et cetera. Uh, all right, with a name like Smuckers, it has to be good. <laughs> Suppressed premise, right? Um, because names have to sound good. With the names like, uh, names have to sound good uh, for a product to sell. With a name like Smuckers, it must be good for it to sell. And there's a lot, so I'm not going to go through all of these, but you can see enthymemes are awesome. I <laughs> remember this one. Senator, I served with Jack Kennedy. I knew Jack Kennedy. Jack Kennedy was a friend of mine. Senator, you're no Jack Kennedy. Yeah, that's a little old. 1988. Ancient. Still a good one, yes. All right, so think about this. This is kind of fun. Uh, notice how many enthymemes you use in a day and here in a day. And again, feel free to point this out to people uh, because they'll really appreciate it. Oh, I, I see your enthymeme, and I raise you a syllogism. They really like this. And if you can sew in Derrida on post-structuralism, all the better. Talk about signifiers and transcendental signifieds, love it. Now, um, more recently, 1968, in fact, Lloyd Bitzer, rhetorician, uh, came up with this idea, uh, came up. Uh, it's kind of obvious, and I think it's in Aristotle, but Aristotle doesn't spell it out so clearly. It's called the rhetorical situation. And, all right, so it's a rhetor, which is a speaker. By the way, I meant to tell you that um, the, people, the people who who taught rhetoric in ancient Greece were called sophists. And they get set up and get a bad reputation. It's ironic that they don't have many texts because <laughs> they were experts at how to use words. But they don't have many texts. Uh, and so just the way, the way the gospel writers depict the Pharisees inaccurately against Jesus, the Pharisees were a fairly liberal group, you know, but they get crap 
you know, from the gospel writers, because Jesus needs a foil, right? He needs someone to be against, or better, he needs someone to be against him. Same thing is true in the Platonic dialogues with the Sophists. These were rhetoric teachers. Actually, they had more students than Plato and Aristotle, uh, which may be the source of some of this, because you, in Athens, you needed to know how to speak well. So they went around teaching people rhetoric, how to speak well. So they come across, especially Plato, they come across as these hacks, you know, who are just trying to uh, convince you of things that aren't true. All right, so this is a rhetorical situation. I think you know what that is, but it's spelled out here by Bitzer. Uh, you have a speaker, you have uh, a medium, such as a speech, you have an audience, and you have certain constraints, but more importantly than that, a constraint would be like time or space. You have an issue, or what he calls an exigence. You have something that needs doing, right? The audience is here for a reason, and you need to address that reason and resolve it for them. Uh, he calls it an imperfection marked by urgency. It is a defect, an obstacle, something waiting to be done, a thing which is other than it should be. All right. Oh, semiotics. I know you were waiting for this. Semiotics from the Greek word semeon or sign. So remember back with uh, Sassur and Derrida, we were talking about signs. Well, uh, turns out that there's a whole discipline that emerged with Roland Barthes in his little book, Mythologies, that's called semiotics. You've probably experienced this in one way or another. Semiotics is simply the study of signs. Why don't you call it the study of words? Because it's not the study of words. It's the study of any signifying element. So the traffic light is a sign. Um, uh, a t-shirt that says plant powered is a sign. Your, your outfit is a sign. So it's not limited to textual elements. It can include textual elements. And so in mythologies, Bart, this is 1958 or something, marvelous book. Uh, so he has these little analyses, one or two pages, of things like wrestling. The spectacle of wrestling. Right? The difference is, he's French, so the difference is the semiotic differences between wine and milk. I'm thinking about it. There are a lot of, like you see a glass of wine, and then you see a glass of milk. Different registers are hitting there, right? He does a whole book like that, and then the end... He has a little essay called Myth Today, and he says what we deal with now is signs that have joined with others. All right, let me put it this way simply. A sign, remember signifier and a signified, so the, the word and the mental concept becomes a sign. He says now that sign interacts with another sign and becomes a third level of meaning, right? Thank you for nodding. I appreciate it. <laughs> You're nodding because this is dense stuff. And so you get these, these textual layers, but it's really visual layers. So again, he's French, so he's talking about this um, African saluting the French flag, the tricolor. And he just shows the many layers there because it's sign upon sign upon sign. So you've got the, the African uh, signifier sign. You've got the French tricolor. You've got colors mixing here. You've got this nationalist text at work here. He's saluting the flag. So that's why we get so confused, uh, is that we've just, we're just a wash in signs. Like, there's just so many signs, and there are many levels, and they build upon each other. And I think that sounds right. Um, all right, I'm not going to read all this to you, uh, but... Well, let me, just briefly. Here's because I don't think I explained it very well. Now, what Bart says is that the healthy sign, he actually uses this metaphor, healthy sign is the sign that's aware of its own arbitrariness. Right? So you get in trouble when you use a sign without, without giving it an ironic layer. Listen to this. This is Terry Eagleton explaining Bart. The healthy sign for Bart is one which draws attention to its own arbitrariness. Right? Remember Sassur? 
The sign is arbitrary and unmotivated, which does not try to palm itself off as natural. See, there's where we get in trouble. We think this is natural. This is uncontested. This is obvious. This is clear. But which, in the very moment of conveying a meaning, communicates something of its own relative artificial status as well. Signs which pass themselves off as natural, which offer themselves as the only conceivable way of viewing the world, are by that token authoritarian and ideological. It's one of the functions of ideology to naturalize social reality. Remember in Meanings of America, we kept coming back to this. Myth transforms history into nature. Myth transforms the way things happened to be into the way things must be. And that is a huge move. That's a huge power move, right? Uh, saluting the flag or agreeing that Western democracy represents the true meaning of the word freedom becomes the most obvious spontaneous responses in the world. Ideology in this sense is a kind of contemporary mythology. Um, there's a neo-Marxian critic named Louis Althusser who, who introduces this concept of interpolation that actually plays on Barthes work where he says, uh, he, he says we subject ourselves to the signs that are, that present themselves as absolute. That we do that. For example, he says walking down the street and a cop says, hey you, and you turn around, right? So you submit, we submit ourselves to the tyranny of these signs because you can mean anything. Why does it mean you? You make it mean you, right? You subject yourself to the tyranny of that sign. All right, I love this, Bart. The cultural work done in the past by gods and epic sagas is now done by laundry detergent commercials and comic strip characters. That's the mythology now. This is the genius of semiotics, is it takes that whole sense of the canon and sense of great books out of it and says, you know what? A laundry detergent commercial is functioning the same way as Homer's Odyssey. Pretty interesting, right? You will probably find it interesting that Roland Barthes was run over by a laundry truck and killed. <laughs> Because <laughs> he didn't watch the signs. Yes. Yes. All right. We're almost done. Thank you for hanging in there. But now it's time to enter the matrix. So, Jean Baudrillard, simulacra and simulation, where signs now replace reality. Remember where we started? We started with words in Plato's Cratylus, words as pale imitations of the thing, but still connected to the thing. Now with Jean Baudrillard in 1988, I want to say, simulacra and simulation, he says this, we live with signs only. Jacques Derrida said something very much like this. He said, there is no outside text. There is no outside text. And it's hyphenated, outside text. Because if there is, you must, we come up against this all the time, if there is, you must talk about it using words, using signs. So you can't get out of the sign system. Baudrillard finally uh, culminates this whole process and says signs replace reality. So uh, he begins his book, Simulacra and Simulation, with this uh, Borges short story. Any fans of Borges here? Yeah, I thought you might be, David. So this is an entire short story right here, this paragraph. Uh, and I'm not going to read it for instance of time, but basically it's the story of, Katar I may have mentioned it before, it's the story of some cartographers in an ancient land and they decide they want to make the best map available. Right? And so they make a map and they're like, eh, not quite right. Because we want the map to do what? Represent reality. So it's a sign, right? So they keep making the map and they keep making it bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually the map covers the territory. 
that's the perfect map, isn't it? Where it covers the territory. It's an exact point-by-point -point correspondence. Perfect map. Where'd the territory go? Well, it's underneath the map, but we don't really know that anymore, do we? <laughs> because it's gone. Uh, so here's what he says. If we were able to take as the finest allegory of simulation the Borges tale, where the cartographers of the empire draw up a map so detailed that it ends up exactly covering the territory, um, this fable would then have come full circle for us. And now has nothing but the discrete charm of second order simulacra. Abstraction today is no longer that of the map, the double, the mirror, or the concept. Simulation is no longer that of a territory, a referential being or a substance. It is the generation by models of a real without origin or reality, a hyper-real. And this is his, you may have heard of hyper-reality, it's his phrase, uh, word. The territory no longer precedes the map, nor survives it. We live in the simulacrum. We live in the matrix. You may know that this is uh, the text, the philosophical text that was the basis of the film The Matrix. Jean Baudrillard's Simulacra and Simulation. It is the map that precedes the ter territory, the procession of simulacra. It is the map that engenders the territory, creates the territory. And if we were to revive the fable today, it would be the territory whose shreds are slowly rotting across the map. It is the real and not the map whose vestiges subsist here and there in the deserts, which are no longer those of the empire, but of our own, the desert of the real itself. Or, as he famously puts it, and probably best puts it in the epigraph to the book, the simulacrum is never that which conceals the truth. It is the truth which conceals that there is none. The simulacrum is true. Ecclesiastes. And poor people read this and think that this is actually a quote from the Bible. <laughs> Ecclesiastes, which it isn't, but it doesn't matter, does it? Because his point is made. The simulacrum is true. He, he goes on to say, and I won't inflict any more of this on you. He, oh, yeah, he has a great piece on Disneyland. Let me just read you the Disneyland thing, because we're here. We should do Disneyland. Disneyland is presented as an imaginary. It's presented as an artificial place in order to make us believe that the rest of the world outside of Disneyland is real. Whereas all of Los Angeles and the America that surrounds it are no longer real, but belong to the hyper-real order and to the order of simulation. It is no longer a question of a false representation of reality ideology, but of concealing the fact that the real is no longer real, and thus of saving the reality principle. He also says that once you lose the real, once the map covers the territory, and once you participate fully in that hyper-reality, you know what emerges, he says? Nostalgia, right? Because you know you lost something, but you can't find it because it's beneath you. It's beneath your simulation. Again, the matrix. Uh, he has this wonderful depiction of how, how this process works. So I just want to read that and then we'll wrap up quickly. Such would be the successive phase, phases of the image. An image, an icon, a sign. It is the reflection of a profound reality. Okay, that's Plato. It masks and denatures. A profound reality. Okay, that's kind of mysticism in a way. It masks the absence of a profound reality. Okay, that's literalism, where you take the sign for the thing, and then you stop looking, because you think you found the thing, but all you found is the sign, and then it has no relation to any reality whatsoever. I kind of feel like we're there. Right? It has no relation to any... Re so you're just bouncing back and forth among signs. It's the dictionary exercise, right? 
and you just keep deferring, deferring, deferring. It, and then finally, it is its own pure simulation. So, I know, what a long, strange trip I just took you on. I appreciate your patience. Uh, so what did we do? We went from words, philosophy of language, to rhetoric, to science, to simulacrum, and the very nature of meaning. This is our world. You know the Magritte piece called The Treachery of Images? This is not a pipe. It's not a pipe. I, I can't put tobacco in that and smoke it. This is not a pipe. But it is a pipe. Right? It's a sign of a pipe. But the sign says it's not a pipe. It says it right there. It's not a pipe. But it is, isn't it? This is where we are, right? Words, right? We use them. We need them. It's our number one technology. It's all, like I said in the description of this talk, it's what holds us together. It's the only thing between us. If Brahmavid has a toothache, I can't feel Brahmavid's toothache. I have to imagine it because he tells me it through language. Language is the tissue that connects us. It's very flimsy. It's not a pipe. But it is kind of a pipe. All right. Thanks for your patience.